Good morning, everybody. It is Wednesday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, digital sports producer for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Back with Jason Mackey, our Pirates beat reporter, live from Cincinnati. I guess it's not live. We're recording it. But Jason, that's where you are. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's live for now. It's live in the moment. And um, I guess technically, if we're going to be completely accurate, I'm across the street in Covington, Kentucky. Um, I'll tilt my screen down for a second, but you can kind of see off in the distance there that's Cincinnati. Uh, so I'm excited. They have a workout later today. Going to head over there and um, a different city, same job. It's been a fun spring training, been a long spring training, and I am I'm excited to be here, Adam. I'm excited for opening day. I'm ready for it. I think everyone is, Jason, and that's why I wanted to kind of do basically a preview video um, to start. We're proud to announce to everyone that we're going to be doing a weekly, at least a weekly uh, Pirates video with Jason and uh, Andrew Destin, who's also going to be working out, uh, working on the, on the Pirates beat this season. Uh, He'll so be working out too, I promise you. Uh, that, that is well. Wow. Fanatic. Certainly more than me. Um, so, but but we're gonna have we're gonna have at least a weekly show. If there's breaking news, if there's some other reason that we need to talk pirates, we will do that. But um, you're gonna get your pirates pirates fix probably Tuesdays, Wednesdays, somewhere in that neighborhood because um, you know, baseball schedules are difficult. It's hard to make everything seamlessly perfect, but that is our plan. Um, so, Jason, with with that you know excitement in mind, um, let's talk a little bit about the spring training that was. Um, we're, you know what the roster is going to be most likely. Yeah. Um, but were there any surprises for you? Is this, or is this more or less what you expected when you went down to Bradenton, um, you know, almost two months ago? No, I would say there are some surprises, Adam. Um, Kanan Smith and Jigba has been a fantastic story. And did I expect him to play his way onto the team? No. I mean, I, I would say when we walked into that facility the very first day at Pirate City, like I didn't understand where Kanan Smith and Jigba fit. And he hit well enough and played well enough down there that he, found, he he made a place for himself. And we saw Andrew McCutcheon have some elbow issues. Um, I don't know what the future is going to be like for somebody like G-Man Choi, Connor Joe. I mean, an optimistic look, you could say those guys are going to be impactful parts of the team. Okay, even if they are, they're probably traded. And I don't know. I, I just really like what I saw from Kanan, not to dwell on that too much. Travis Swaggerty is another guy that I probably didn't understand where he fit. And now I think, you know, people are screaming for him to be up here. And, and that's a very good case to make. I think I feel that way. Um, I didn't expect Jason DeLay to be their their number two catcher. Um, I thought I thought it would be Ploiecki, honestly. And if it wasn't Ploiecki, I thought Heineman was a better defensive option. But be that as it may, um, it looks like DeLay, unless they do something at the 11th hour here, which I still wouldn't rule out, wouldn't shock me if they if this video is wrong and they, they have somebody else in there. But as of now, they don't. Um, yeah, and, and we'll get into some other performances like Adari Moretta. I didn't expect him to pitch as well as he has. He's been really good. Um, you know, I did expect the, the older guys to have a positive impact, Austin Hedges, Rich Hill, et cetera, and they've done pretty much as advertised. But, yeah, I think they've had some, some fairly positive storylines. Jason, the guy you and I talked a lot about on this on this channel, you know, all through the winter was, was Key Brian Hayes, and, and he went out there and kind of showed out. Um he put up the numbers that remind you of, of 2020 when he came up to the big league. Yeah. I, I have talked a lot about how he doesn't have to be that guy to be a really good player. Um, I think the number you keep throwing out there is like a 750 OPS. He was What's more he, better than that, yeah. Yeah, right. What did you see from him? Do you think he can be a better player than that? Um, do, you, do you think that that kind of bare minimum that you and I were talking about should be revised higher? Well, I, you'd have to think so, right? I mean – I we went down there again. I, you know, probably shame on me for missing key here, but I mean, he looked, he's looked really good. The swing has looked really good. Um, you know, I'm not expecting him to do what he did in September, 2020. That's, but that's kind of what he's done down here. Um, it's looked like the same swing, the balls, ball flights about the same. Um, I guess we can revise the 750. I'm fine with that. Um, it seems silly right now that that was the expectation, but you know, when you and I talked over the winter, we're talking to guy, you know, back to back sub 700 OPS seasons. People are questioning whether this dude's like, you know, smart to extend or, or a good enough offensive player to survive. And now we're talking about where the heart of the batting order he should hit. So, I mean, that's a, a swift change, a good change. Um, I, I think the truth is, you know, somewhere in the middle, like it often is. And, 
you know, maybe 750 is low. I'm sure one or whatever he's at, 160. I don't even remember the number, but I mean, it's high. It's probably in the middle there. Um, but if this version of Key Brian Hayes continues, man, boy, does that help and change the calculus for the Pirates lineup. Yeah, I think I've always kind of looked at, at, like I said, with 750 being kind of a bare minimum type of number where at that point I think you're talking about a five wins above replacement player when you combine the defensive package with the offensive package. But, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't be better than five wins above replacement, right, Jason? You can keep pushing that higher and higher, and I think that's where the offense would, would come in for him. Um I wanted to talk a little bit about Smith and Jig, but where does he fit? What is the workload going to look like? How much are they going to try to get him into this lineup early on um, in that outfield rotation? They better. Uh, they need to. And, and it's a complicated situation. I'm going, to, I'm going to explain B first before getting back to A. But with McCutcheon's elbow, like that kind of complicates their DH route. Um, if you think about Carlos Santana, G-Man Choi, Andrew McCutcheon, one of them is going to play first base. McCutcheon can kind of play the outfield, and then you're going to use a DH. So basically, if you DH McCutcheon, you're playing Santana at first. You're playing paying Choi four and a half million bucks to sit on the bench. That's not ideal. Um, if Kanan is producing, and this is where I'll switch back to A, if he's producing, I it should be a timeshare with Jack Sawinski. I, I I'm fine with Jack Sawinski being on the team and in the outfield rotation. But I think he finished Grapefruit League play with 23 strikeouts, something like that, a sub 200 average. You could pull a bunch of fancier numbers that just explain that he wasn't very good offensively. He's working through some swing changes. He hit 19 home runs last year. That's not to be discounted. But Kanan's been really good, and there's nothing that says Sawinski needs to play every day. So anyway, I mean, what you could get to, and this is probably the short version of the answer, is Brian Reynolds and everybody else. If it's Reynolds and then Kanan and Kutch one day, if it's Sawinski and Joe, uh, whatever you have to do, rotate them in and out. Reynolds is the only constant. That's the way I'd look at it until somebody sort of grabs a hold of another job. Yeah, I think that's that's it's it's an interesting mix. I think a lot of people loved Sawinski last season because he was. I mean, it's very rare we've seen a guy come up with that kind of power, Jason. But it, you know, there certainly aren't signs to me that he straightened out the problems either and that doesn't mean that he can't it just means that we're not there yet right yeah i mean i i, I like sawinski a lot he, he's one of my favorites in that clubhouse man anything i say critical of him is certainly not um you know thinking that like he won't figure it out or he's a bad player or an incomplete player or whatever but like the results haven't been there and you want to play the guys who are producing the best results and it's okay to say look Kanan's hitting better right now he's going to play um defensively they were really bad in the outfield the first half of spring training. I'll give them credit. They improved, but that's not to say that the regular season starts and we couldn't see issues again. And some of them were communication issues and read issues with Sawinski and center. Like if that persists and the offense isn't there, they're not wrong for turning the page and looking at somebody else or trying to, you know, bump Reynolds over and we're going to play Kanan and left, whatever it may be. Um, I, I want Jack to win a job. I think he can win a job. I think he's capable of doing that, but he hasn't done that right now we're saying okay his sample size of moderate success in the major leagues is basically better than spring training which is fair that gets him on the roster i think people are saying he doesn't deserve to be on the roster or overreacting but he doesn't have to play every day jason beyond um smith and jigba hayes a couple other guys the offensive numbers this spring were broadly not good um yeah. and we don't you know you don't want to make too much of spring training numbers but you don't want to completely dismiss dismiss them as, a, as an idea of where these guys are at this present time. Who in that offensive group do you feel like is in the best place just based on you watching them every day down there um, to, to kind of, you know, produce when the games really start to matter here? I guess I'd go with Key Brian, Adam. Uh, it's, it's hard to not. He's been just so good and so consistent. I really like where his swing is at. Um, there are like bits and pieces of others that I really like. I think O'Neill Cruz has gotten better with some of his swing decisions. And I've watched him chase breaking stuff and struggle to hit lefties. If that has happened this spring, don't get me wrong. It's just less consistent than it's been in the past. And that should be a good sign. Um, thinking about some other guys, like Carlos Santana has been really quiet. We talked about Sawinski's strikeouts. Rodolfo Castro has been relatively disappointing as well. Haven't seen much there. Um, Kutch's offense picked up late in spring. Reynolds' offense picked up late in spring. Those two are not a concern whatsoever for me. Um, I think I said earlier, Santana's been a little on the quiet side, a little not enamored with what he's done, but he's also a veteran. I'm not going to make too many 
decisions based on spring training. But yeah, in the best place right now, I would say Key and then followed shortly by Kanan. Um, I want to also switch gears and ask a similar question about the rotation, which is four of the six guys that are in this mix to start uh, have currently ERAs over 450 in spring training. Uh, Ronzi Contreras, Mitch Keller, they were pretty good down there. Uh, but the other guys don't seem quite as dialed in. Who are you most confident is going to be dialed in when when the game starts to matter? Yeah, um, I would throw Oviedo in, in the good batch. Um, if we're separating like scary versus confident, um, I think that his ERA has been kind of misleading. Anybody who watched him pitch the last two outings, I mean, seven strikeouts and back-to-back efforts, I think four and five innings. Um, I've really liked the way his stuff looks at him. I, I think I, I'm, I'm excited for this kid to make the rotation. I think he deserves it. Um, I think there's a potential he could be really good. So I, he he's not a concern in my mind. Um, I know people are all up in arms about Rich Hill. Um, I saw that you know, reaction to it. Then I tweeted something like, you know, his spring training numbers are crap. And so were Tyler Anderson's and Jose Quintana's and, you know, Rich Hill might be ineffective. I don't know, but I don't, I'm I'm not going to base that decision based on spring training. Like I still have no issue with the signing. I have no issue with giving it a shot and I want to see what he has. I mean, his breaking stuff has been sharp. His fastball command has been okay. We've certainly seen it better. And I saw in a couple of his earlier outings, what it can be. Um, so it's there. It wasn't there the past two starts, certainly, but I don't think Rich Hill suddenly hit like the, the he di- didn't suddenly expire entering the final two Grapefruit League starts. Like the dude's 43, he's been around a little bit. Um, it's possible to have it. Now, can he have it consistently enough? I don't know. And we're going to find out. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think of, of just to kind of give an overview, though, but uh, Luis Ortiz, I expected maybe a little bit more from him, but I also don't think he ever really had a shot at making the rotation. He's just too inconsistent at this point. There's nothing wrong with that. The changeup will help him a ton. Like what I've seen from Rowanzi, the only crime there is they're still cre- treating him with kid gloves. I'd like to see him get stretched out a little bit more, uh, but with time. Could you tell me a little bit more about the JT Brubaker situation and what you expect there, A, and then B – you know, when, what, if and when he comes back to this rotation, who is the who's the bump candidate, or is it possible there will be six guys in this rotation when he's healthy? Well, um, I'm not hearing good things on Brew. Well, let's put it that way. Um, this is not, you know, firm enough to report. It's just firm enough to talk about as we film a video. Um, the next positive, um, you know, affirmation or whatever, where oh, he's going to be fine, it's going to be okay. Uh, the next one of those will be the first. It's a lot of like, they're really searching. They're getting a lot of opinions. That's generally not a good thing. Elbow, forearm, throwing related. Um, Anyway, I I worry that this could be a bigger thing, Adam. I think we're probably going to get some news today from Derek Shelton. But um, if it is a longer thing, I mean, I worry first for Brubaker's health. He's had elbow issues before. That's never good. Um, But to answer the question and to sort of outlay or to lay out that scenario, um, a bump candidate, I I don't know. I don't know if there is one. And I don't think like if Brubaker comes back and everybody is pitching well, I wouldn't rule out him going to the bullpen because there's not a bump candidate. Um, You know, it it could be a Wally Pip kind of situation. I I think that's a little bit too strong, too early, all that stuff. But, you know, I do think about if he's had repeated elbow issues, if he comes back, everybody's pitching. There's probably a time where JT Brubaker becomes a reliever. Just sink or slider, strike people out. Don't worry about a third pitch or or whatever. Save your arm. This might be that time. I'm curious, and we just need to know more about his injury first. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, I I think that's definitely a worthwhile answer. Is that he could be the bump candidate himself um, if he's healthy. Yeah. But yeah, that that doesn't sound great. So we'll hope for some some better news there in the coming days and hours. I guess. Um, Jason, I want to talk a little bit about the bullpen. I think you let in well if, if JT Brubaker ends up there. Uh, what's your sense of this group? You mentioned Dari Moretta earlier. Um, is it going to be better? And, and if, if you think so, and I think I, I kind of do, um, how much better do you think it has the potential to be? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of um, variance here or, or chances for all kinds of stuff to happen. Um, you know, I, I think that can be a little bit better. They shouldn't be, what were they, second or third worst 
an ERA last year. Like they have the stuff there to be, be better numbers wise. Um, I'd like to see them maybe in the, like the middle third of major league baseball. I think for the pirates to have some moderate success, they need that bullpen to be good. You and I have talked about this before, Adam, that the Huntington era and that regime did a pretty good job cobbling together bullpens. And this one has it. So, but the, I don't think it's because they have bad pitchers there. I think just the pitchers they have have pitched poorly and they've gotten hurt and have, have had guys out of position. So if I talk individual names, like, you know, Bednar is going to close games. I've been impressed with Holderman. And I think there's the possibility he could be a really good setup candidate. One of the X factors for me in there is Dwayne Underwood Jr. Um, I wrote a story earlier this year when he came back from the WBC about how big it would be for the Pirates for him to be a reliable bridge to Bednar. They have a lot of the other roles covered. And that was one where, like, they, they kind of got kicked around when Dwayne pitched out of position and didn't pitch terribly well. So if it's him and Holderman getting the ball to Bednar, cool. Then you go with, like, Will Crow, Chase DeYoung. They're pitching in roles that they should be pitching in, sixth and seventh innings. Uh, one concern that I do have is Harleen Garcia and his arm. He's out for the foreseeable future. That also sounds fairly longer term. Jose Hernandez, their Rule 5 kid, I like him a lot, but he kind of got beat around in spring. He's their only lefty. At this point, I don't, you know, for as much as they like the match up and as terrible as some of their current guys have fared against left-handers, like they need a left-hander in the bullpen. And so Rob Zestrisny, I think, has a very good chance of making this team because of that, if he hasn't already. Um, and Dari Moretta is a name we've sort of danced around and actually a former Cincinnati Red, but he's been really good and, you know, pretty good uh, off-speed stuff for him. I've been impressed with the slider and changeup. Jason, was there anyone else who really caught your eye down there? Whether it's you know someone who's going to be on the opening day roster, whether it's going to be you know whether it's a prospect um, who you you kind of got to check out up close for the first time in a while, you know, just looking back on the totality of the time yeah. you were down in Bradenton, uh, you know, what are some some things that stood out to you? How lame am I if I, if I say Andy? I, I feel like that's pretty lame. A lot, a lot of people would say Andy stood out. Uh, I'm excited to see how he fares against major league pitching. I think. It's, it's completely possible that his bat is ready. Um, the only thing holding him back is defense. And we can sit here and have a debate about, does it make more sense to play him up here as a catcher? He might be light on reps, but he gets a lot of practice time with Austin Hedges and they're catching people. I go back and forth. I don't know how I feel about it. An argument could be made for it for sure. Um, I want to see how quickly he matures at AAA and what happens. I was impressed with him. Um, so as to not dwell on him, though, uh, honestly, Adam, one of the things that I, I like about what they have going on is some of their younger pitchers. I think I, I've written this story, I think maybe even twice now, but um, I, I don't think it gets enough credit. I mentioned Ortiz before people saw him. Mike Burroughs, I've seen him. I realize a lot of like mainstream Pirates fans have not. He's really good. Quinn Priester, same deal. Um, Carmen Majinski made the move. I think, I think he's going to end up being a reliever to start the year and was one of their best pitchers in spring. His stuff really plays well as a reliever, and I think he can be dominant back there. Colin Selby's another reliever you're going to see. Kyle Nicholas is a starter that had a really good spring. So anyway, they're going to dip down to the minor leagues for pitching. And I think a couple years ago, you would have looked at that part of the Pirates and said, oh, my goodness, they stink. What are they doing? And that is greatly improved. Like, I am genuinely excited to see how these guys fare. Um, who, I think we, I think we probably both agree that Endy's probably the, the, well, I don't know. This is, this is a complicated question because you mentioned they might have to dip into, to the minors for pitching. Um, but you know, other than Endy Rodriguez kind of being that guy who, who may, who may get super tuned for lack of a better term, right. um, who else is in that category of the guys you think we'll see first? Um, I think Burroughs will be up before long. Um, I, you know, I, I go back and forth on the Super 2 thing, Adam, because I think about how soon guys can get up here, right? And, like, you can make the argument, and he's played six games at AAA. If he has a bad first month, even if it's just a bad first month, are they Super 2 him by not bringing him up here? I, I don't know. I mean, we haven't seen him clean up. I, I think we just need more data with that. I'm not defending it. They might Super 2 guys, certainly. Um, but the guys we might see first, I would say Andy is at the top of that list. Um, I, I feel less confident about Henry, honestly, uh, maybe because some of their infield, like guys failure to seize a job. Like if Castro struggles, if Bay struggles and, and uh, Nick Gonzalez tears it up at AAA, I think he's a guy people could see. I think he had a really good spring and sort of made a name for himself. 
people were questioning his bat, certainly, but I think he showed this spring why that's probably not a smart move. Real good hitter. Um, Triolo's dealing with a, um, a hamate bone injury in his hand. Todd Tomzik told us that one earlier this week. So he would have been on my list, but uh, I don't think we'll see him. He also had a terrible spring at the plate. So, I mean, those are the guys. I mentioned Selby earlier and Burroughs. Those are the two pitchers I think I would expect to see. I, I guess Luis Ortiz, too. I always forget him. I always, like, lump him in with the major league crowd, and I shouldn't. Um, I, the only thing I'd say, Jason, is the only reason I would say Andy Rodriguez is, <clears throat> excuse me, getting super chewed is because of the, the status of that, that catching core, core right now. Um, so, you know, I, I would like to see him more than I want to see those guys. And I think oh, I, I have a lot of Pirates fans are in that category. That's the only reason I would say that I'm, if they had better guys in those spots, you know, warming the seat for him, I think it'd be a different discussion here. Here's where I come down on that, Adam. And I think that's a totally fair point. Um, offensively, he's fine. I mean, offensively, he's elite. He's really good. I watched him defensively. It's not great. It's, it's not, he's not ready. Um, and you can, t- you can think about that two different ways. Like I can think about, he's not ready. Okay. He needs to catch every day and get ready. Like reps will help him. Um, or I can think about it. He should come up here and get ready at the big league level. Like if his bat's good enough, Austin Hedges is supposedly, well, I shouldn't say supposedly I watched it. Like he's a really good dude. Like he takes a lot of interest in helping people, be it pitchers, other catchers, like Austin Hedges can mentor him defensively. Cool. That's a great marriage. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know what the best move is for Andy Rodriguez. I certainly understand why people want to see him, but I also understand the argument for keeping him down to play more. Because, like, I'm down in spring training, right? These are, This is what you do in spring training. You just walk around, at least what I do. I walk around with, like, a bottle of water and sunscreen all over me, and I just watch drills. And I talk to random people, and I talk to random people about what we're watching on drills. So I'm over watching catching drills a lot. It's one of my favorite things to watch. And I'm watching guys, like, move side to side and block. And he's not like, you know, consistently struggling to keep the ball in front of him. They're throwing both he and Henry. Henry's consistently sailing throws over second base. And is consistently spiking them behind the pitcher's mouth. There's nothing I saw in games from either of those two, frankly, to change my mind, to say that they're suddenly ready. Like I watched Andy throw a while to second in games and I watched him struggle to keep the ball in front of himself in games. I'm not going to put a guy who's physically not ready to handle the demands of the position in the major leagues and risk that. Like, I'm okay keeping him down. But if you do bring him up, you need to make sure he's, like, handled very, very carefully. And I'm not sure I would introduce that right now. I think the minor leagues probably is a better place for him. He's only played six games in AAA. There's no crime committed here if if he plays another month. Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree. I think, you know, if, if I was voicing my frustration, it'd be more that that you didn't get, you know, kind of, you know, at least a bona fide number one. I'm not sure Hedges did that. I think he'd be a great backup catcher. Um, but I, I think it's just the, the status of the depth chart that um, makes you want to see that guy who maybe isn't ready. Um, going on to uh, the big picture, Jason, I think you and I have talked. I think you said 74, 75 wins is kind of what you're looking at. Uh, that was that was kind of your soft record prediction. I'm going to put you on the record now with a hard record prediction. A, what is it? And B, you know, did you see anything down there that caused you to revise it? No, I wouldn't say caused me to revi- revise it. Uh, maybe it solidified it a little bit more. I'm going 74 wins to not bury the lead. Um, I do think it's a pretty substantial jump over where they were last year. Um, and maybe that's too lofty for some people. But I do know this based on – you know, how they've conducted themselves, what I've heard from all levels of the organization, what they did this offseason, which I know outside people will look at and say, well, they didn't do much. But for them, like, it's a pretty substantial – they haven't added this many pieces, players in a long time. If they win fewer than 68 games, I think there's going to be a lot of upset people over at PNC Park. And, you know, I question how many people stay in their position, meaning like if they get off to a lousy start, did they move on from Derek Shelton? I don't know. But anyway, I, I see 74 wins. I see improvement. I do see them getting better. Um, I know some people have said more than that, but I, I can't go there. Where are you at? I said 70 going into this. <clears throat> I'm going to stick with it. I think especially because, you know, I think a lot relies on these these big names that they brought in, <clears throat> excuse me, who I think are probably going to get shipped out at, at the deadline. Um, and I think that's going to make the team worse. I, I think any momentum you see early on is going to be somewhat blunted by 
um, you know, that down the stretch. We've seen past Pirates teams in this situation where they're not quite ready to compete. They, they kind of go down that same rabbit hole of, you know, they win some games, but they, they really sputter down the stretch. So that's why I'm going to stick with 70. Um, you know, and if they play better early in the season, then I, I guess I have a chance to be wrong. But, you know, with the over-under in Vegas, I don't know. I shouldn't say Vegas because now you can gamble anywhere. But uh, it's 67 and a half has been, been the over-under. I think they confidently go over that, but that number being where it is, Jason, does, you know, just leave me a little bit concerned that maybe some guys know some things that we don't. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that stuff, too, is just based on reputation, right? Like, it's the Pirates. They're they're cobbling together stuff that people can't possibly see. I, I was struck by a quote uh, Will Crow had. He was paraphrasing something Dylan Peters said, and not to, like, you know, put either on the pedestal of, like, the orators of, of our time, but they're right. Um, they're paraphrasing the idea of like, why can't I get better as a player? Why can't I be better this year than I was last year? You know, and I started thinking about that, Adam. I started thinking about that for me as a writer, reporter, um, anybody that's doing their job. Why can't you be better at your job in 12 months? Why? You know, and they, they can. The Pirates can legitimately be better at their job. And I look at things, okay, what can they change to be better at their job? How can the Pirates be better at their job? Well, making routine plays was something they did horribly last season. They led the league in errors by a long shot, not because they were in the wrong position, but just they didn't execute these plays. So can the Pirates field a ground ball? I'd like to think so. Can their offense not have the second worst OPS in the league? Given what they added this offseason, yeah, I think it's possible. Can they not walk the yard? Yeah, I think it's possible. I mean, it's been a pretty good push to throw their stuff over the plate. They've got guys who will do it. Um, they've got some guys who have matured. So anyway, I, I, that quote just, has just been ringing around in my head about, you know, why why can't we get better? Why can't they get better? And I don't, I don't think Vegas considers any of that. I think they just consider, well, the Pirates, they're the Pirates. They stink. They're always going to be the Pirates and 68 wins, whatever. They consider what they can get money on both sides of, right? That's how they win. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think that's why they're a popular um, you know, overpick. I, I agree with that. I think they're going to go over 67 and a half. I just don't know how far because I think eight wins is a pretty substantial improvement. It's just you're starting from such a low point, Jason. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's unsatisfying that 70 might be a, a real step, but still not what people are looking for. Uh, before I let you go, Jason, I want to get into this Forbes report from last week. Um, you know, they do their annual franchise valuations on how much a team is worth. The interesting thing that they did this year that they have not done in previous years is, um, you know, put out their estimates for what every local TV deal in baseball, with the exception of Toronto, which isn't tracked by Nielsen data is. Um, and the Pirates came in at, uh, they were had, making as much or uh, there, it was 61 million. That was the number that they, they're pegging the local TV value at. We should add the caveat that because of the situation with AT&T Sportsnet, looking forward, that could be a completely different situation. Things could be changing in a very substantial way. But at least since that deal was signed in 2019, their suggestion is the Pirates were making about you know, mid, mid-pack in baseball local television revenue, which is really the big driver of how big of a market are you. Um, Jason, what's, what's your reaction to that report? Well, I have a few reactions. Um one, I, my understanding of the number is that it's lower than 61. Um, how much lower, I don't know. Um, two, I, I mean, should the Pirates be spending more than they are? Yes, I'd like to think that. Um, have they spent a lot recently? Absolutely not. Are they also in the middle of a rebuild where I question whether they had any interest whatsoever in winning the past three years versus going scorched earth? No, I don't think they, they do. Um, so, I mean, we can take the discussion any which way. It's probably a you know, hour long discussion anyway about the impact of television rights and where I see that going for the pirates or, you know, I mean, or, or, but, but I sort of came away with that thinking like, what are we trying to say here? Are we trying to say that the pirates haven't spent a lot of money recently? Are we trying to say that their market is, or that, you know, how do I say this? That, cause I, I'm not saying that they're stealing money. That's not, that's not the accusation I'm trying to make, because if I say that I'm going to hear from it, you know, hear from them a ton, but you know, that seems to be the, the criticism, right? That like they're making all this money and they're not funneling it back into players. But I mean, they're also rebuilding. Um, they would tell you that they're going to spend their money on the Dominican Academy or on processes and minor league stuff and this, that and the other. And we can't prove it. Uh, we can't prove it on the outside. Forbes can't prove it. 
Nobody can prove it. People who play the game can't prove it. Major League Baseball is audited by a third party. Um, I'd love to see those documents. We don't. Forbes doesn't have access to them. Forbes doesn't has, have complete access to their books. So, I mean, we're going on a lot of external numbers that it's always been my impression that the internal numbers are different than that. So I, I'm trying to look at it holistically and saying they haven't spent a lot in recent years. Certainly, certainly fair to criticize them for failure to spend. Certainly fair to criticize them for failure to win. But drilling down into the minutia when those documents aren't publicly accessible and Forbes is generally going on like industry expectation. And at least as I understand, one of the like barometers that that expect expectation is being set off of is not completely accurate. I don't know. I, I, I look at it a couple different ways. Well, and I, I think it's worth saying that, you know, I've also seen that number be 44, which would put them right in the league with some of the smallest markets in baseball. Um, you know, that, that's I think that was Fangraph's number that was put out there that, that we'd been going off of for a while. So in my understanding, Adam, it, it's somewhere in the middle. In the, in the middle of there. It's just, you know, is, is it on the 44 end? Is it on the 60 end? We don't know. Sure. And I think, you know, if I'm going to make, if I'm going to make the argument of, of why this matters, I'd say we've been told that, that they had to tank for as long as they have to have any chance of them, you know, being any good. And, and I think I would make the argument that you could have put a more presentable product on the field while doing, you know, rebuilding stuff, you know, kind of under the surface. You had the, you had the money to put a more competitive product out there while doing a lot of the things that you're doing. And I know the like top draft picks draft picks that go along with it. Right, right. But but you know, there's you're going to get first round draft even when they were winning, they got first round draft picks that made impacts, right? And if they didn't, it's because they didn't develop those guys the way that they should have. Um cuz someday they're going to be good, Jason, and are we just going to say, "Well, now that they're drafting at, you know, 20, now these guys have no chance of being any good." I I don't look at it that way. I think you could have navigated more of a middle course i think that's what the the numbers suggest is that the the what the story we're being told the only option was to lose 100 games basically for three years i don't know if i agree with that okay i mean other teams have pulled it off the cubs the astros the orioles i mean they're not the first team to to blow it up and that's what they did and yeah you can sit here and say that they should have won more games recently i mean i i get that i don't i don't know if you're wrong but, I mean, the counter argument might be, well, we lost a crap load of games and now we're sitting here with 1-1 for the second time in three years with a chance to draft Dylan Cruz. What if they do that and in three years they're really good? Is anybody going to be talking about the Forbes article from March of 2023? No, nobody gives a crap. And nobody gives a crap, it's my contention, about the finances if they would win. If they would turn out to be the Tampa Bay Rays or Cleveland Guardians and win on a small market, or, you know, on, on a small market budget, nobody would be giving a rats you know what about their finances they just be talking about winning baseball and it's a convenient argument to say like oh they didn't spend in the last regime well their payroll went from 39 to 100 million dollars and i'm not, i'm not defending it but that's factual so if their payroll went from a whole bunch of crap in 2020 and then they incrementally grow that as they win as they did in the last one like what's our argument here like my argument or my my understanding with the reynolds talk like you know, we're talking about a $100 million contract if it gets done. That'll be the first in the history of the franchise. I understand the history of the franchise when it comes to contracts stinks. I'm not defending it. But if you extend Key Brian Hayes and you extend Brian Reynolds, like, isn't that fundamentally doing different business differently than you've done in the past? So, like, why are we not to believe that maybe they could actually be different and draft good players, develop good players, and then those players come up and play winning baseball? Like, that that's just – in. in Yes, part of that is sucking for three years, and they've done that. But the idea is you need to suck for three years and then come out of it actually good, which they haven't done in the past. They've sucked for three years and then just continued to suck. Well, I think I think you set it up pretty well there, Jason. I think the Reynolds contract will tell us a lot. I I, I look at the Hayes extension as that, that has the potential to be a, an all-time steal, and, and and they should have signed that as soon as that number was out there. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't give them a ton of credit for that because I think they're going to get a ton of value out of that contract. Reynolds is a more complicated situation because he's older um, and and more established and close enough to free agency that he doesn't have to be here if he doesn't want to be. Um, Let me so, ask you this, Adam. Let me ask you this because I think you and I do sit on different ends of this debate, and that's fine. And it, it, it should we we should all respect each other's opinions in this. I don't think that happens enough. But if they sign Reynolds for let's say seven or eight years and a 
hundred and nine million dollars. I'm just I'm I'm making that up. Do you think differently about them? Would Absolutely. that change your perception of the Pirates? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the type of uh, you know they're not going to be able to keep everyone. We all know that. I think I said on an earlier video this off season, if you're signing one long long term contract in off season, that that's kind of my baseline for what what seems fair. Um, yeah. You're not going to be able to keep everyone. There's guys that you're going to have to trade. Um, it's not about keeping everyone. It's about keeping those those real key guys um, and, and not kind of being this total revolving door. And I think we've seen other small market franchises do that. And so I don't think it's unreasonable to ask the Pirates to do, you know, one of those big deals in offseason. And then if other guys have to go, they have to go. Yeah. I don't disagree with you. I think they I think they need to sign Reynolds. They need to sign Reynolds or Cruz. If they're if they're gonna let Reynolds if like they can't get things done with Brian Reynolds, and this would be like today, today, tomorrow, if that falls short, like you need you need to lock up O'Neill Cruz. That that that's it. And I think if that happens, I think we'll hear a lot of what you just said. And that's why I asked you, like people will think differently about how the pirates are doing business if they get those deals done. And then again, you, it just further, we, we care. How do I say it? The, the, the concern over the three losing seasons or finances or all this stuff that people dwell on whenever they stink, like goes away. It's a very easy way to disprove that. And I, I do think there's genuine interest in them doing that. The only thing I'll say is I really want to see what that cruise number is before I, you know, because it's it's possible they could get another steal like they did with Hayes. But, um, you know, I think generally speaking, what I said is accurate. One big deal in off season, I think that would make people pretty happy. But, Jason, I think we're already over time with you here. I want to let you go. I know the clubhouse is opening soon. Um, thanks for joining us. Like we said, folks, if you missed it at the top of the video, uh, we're going to be doing Pirates every week. We're going to have Jason every week. And if Jason's traveling, we're going to have Andrew Destin. And it's going to be a lot of fun talking baseball. I'm excited about it, Jason. I am too. Thank you for having me. And you were right. I need to somehow make it over there in 23 minutes. I think I can do it. All right. Well, enjoy opening day, everyone. Take care, Jason. Good All luck. Right. Later, guys. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you liked the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it on Apple Podcasts, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down in the description.